Tonight's the night. I deem November 7th, 2021 to be a historical occurrence. The first episode of Dexter New Blood has just been released on Showtime. Despite the very disappointing ending from the original Dexter series, this extension's first episode almost completely obliterates the negative storytelling from 2013. I make this bold claim not just because Clyde Phillips is back, but because of what I witnessed from this exquisite installment. There's a lot of melancholy symbolism as well as downright depressing visuals that really get the viewer thinking about the past life of Dexter Morgan. In this video, I'm going to be giving an overview as well as executing a deep search of the overall episode. This includes talking about any and all of the references from the original Dexter, and even if it's just a singular phrase, I will mention it. After this, I'm going to be giving my overall opinion of the episode and how well I believe it utilizes its characters. It's time to open our eyes and look at exactly what Dexter is doing. Enjoy. Our story starts off with Dexter running through the snowy landscape of Iron Lake, New York. The song, The Passenger, plays throughout the scene. The song's significance is very clear once you pay attention to the lyrics. These are the first few. I am the passenger. I ride and I ride. I ride through the city's backside. I see the stars come out of the sky. Yeah, the brightly and hollow sky. You know it looks so good tonight. Looking at the first sentence, we can clearly distinguish the passenger that's mentioned in the song from Dexter's Dark Passenger. The show wants us to know that Dexter still has his urges to kill, even though his killings end up destroying everyone around him. We are reinforced with the idea that this urge is something that cannot be controlled nor quelled for a long period of time. The second sentence references the first episode of the original series, when Dexter rides off to kill Mike Donovan. I'm aware that this song was not made custom for this episode, but I still can't help but connect this incident to the song. If we look at the lyric, through the city's backside, more broadly, we can incorporate Dexter's personality. Just like the silent shadow lurking through the backside of civilization, Dexter will always be a looming example of vigilanteism, killing as he sees fit, not because of any sense of justice, but because of the demon lurking within him. The rest of the lyrics, in my opinion, reference the catchphrase, Tonight's the Night. The reason why Dexter is running through the snow could be symbolic of Dexter's need to survive. He presses on through the harshest environments because he is the alpha predator in this world. Once he stops running, we can see what he's pursuing, a white deer. He aims his gun and is about to shoot the creature, but yields the shooting. The deer runs away and Dexter falls to his knees. This could symbolize the father-son dynamic in season one, episode three of Dexter when Harry takes Dexter hunting and allows him to kill the deer after being shot. The reason why he doesn't kill the deer this time around is because he's trying to control his way of life, the deer representing this philosophical change. Another reason why I think this is because of the particular type of lens the cinematographer used for this scene. When we see Dexter, there's an enormous amount of bokeh that's behind him, symbolizing isolation and internal thought. Dexter could be thinking of this exact moment with Harry and comparing and contrasting his old life against his new life. We then see Dexter chopping firewood and placing it in a huge fire pit. I would just like to take a second to admire the beautiful composition. The production designer and cinematographer did an outstanding job. We continue to see Dexter's daily routine of maintaining his home environment. Once he's done chopping, he enters his home and approaches a calendar. On the calendar, we see days crossed out with red marks. This could be Dexter keeping track of how much time has gone by without killing anybody, or it could represent how many days it's been since he killed Deborah, which is more or less the same thing. An equally realistic thought is that he's just keeping track of completing his daily chores. An unexpected voice becomes audible, the voice being that of Deborah Morgan. It seems she has replaced Harry Morgan as the internal apparition that follows Dexter around in his head. Deborah makes a remark about Dexter's plans for the evening. Dexter replies in an uninterested way, showing that his social life is more or less a cover and not genuine. He then makes a comment about how cold the area is, and Deborah replies by saying, You pick this place. It's possible during the time Dexter was a lumberjack, he was recognized by somebody, or at the very least, he was nervous about his identity getting out because of the advancement of technology. This would lead him to move locations once again. He could have moved all over the country, or immediately moved to Iron Lake. The information is unknown. Dexter sits down with Deborah and begins eating his cereal. However, after a moment has gone by, Deborah disappears, giving us a visual representation of his broken mind and potentially his grief that he puts upon himself. Once done with his breakfast, 
Dexter sharpens a meat cleaver and places it in a leather roll-up knife storage case. The title card then appears, using the element of ice as the texture, possibly representing the slippery slope his life is about to turn toward in the upcoming season. We then see a bunch of images from this episode flashing on screen. I won't look over them quite yet because I will analyze them shortly. In the first scene following the title sequence, Dexter is driving down a road and gets pulled over by a cop. The scene rises with suspense, but it is quickly made clear that this police officer is Dexter's girlfriend, Angela Bishop, and they both start having sex in the back seat of the police cruiser. Dispatch radios Angela and they have to postpone their fuck session. Dexter continues his way into town with the song, King of a One Horse Town. The opening lyrics are, Every day is just a little white lie, telling myself I'm getting by. The first lyric of the song clearly represents the charade that Dexter has to keep up in order to survive, while the second line tells us that he also lies to himself internally, claiming that he is getting by, when in actually he's slipping every day. Dexter parks his pickup truck and hops out, greeting local inhabitants with open arms. A helicopter flies overhead and one of the townspeople says, the passenger in that helicopter is somebody named Edward Olson. After looking at IMDb, there is a person named Frederick Lennon that's playing a character by the name of Edward, but the last name, Olsen, wasn't mentioned. Perhaps this Edward could be a key character in this series. I guess we'll find out in the upcoming months. After the conversation about who was in the helicopter, Dexter continues to walk until he reaches a butcher shop. A man chopping up a pig catches his eye, and Dexter stares at the copious amounts of blood dripping from the pig's carcass. After standing stationary for a few seconds, Dexter approaches the man with a sharpened meat cleaver from earlier. We think he's about to kill the man, but instead, he gives the cleaver to him. This scene really signifies the bloodlust Dexter still has within himself. Even though he feels an immense amount of guilt from killing Deborah, he is still overwhelmed by his bloodlust. The man, whose name is Gig, thanks Dexter and continues chopping the pig. We then jump a few moments and Dexter is coming out of a store with what looks to be pastries. He walks a couple blocks until he reaches his workplace, which is a gun store. Before he enters the store, he notices a knife that's in the wrong position. He enters and fixes this mistake. This moment could symbolize Dexter's urge to correct his past mistakes. A second representation could be the knife pointing downward and then being switched upward shows that Dexter wants to look forward and not dwell on the past. Either meaning would make sense given the context of the past seasons. After fixing the knife's position, Dexter prepares for his job. He puts on his plastic identification badge, his alias being Jim Lindsay. For those who don't know, the name Jim Lindsay is a nod to the author Jeff Lindsay, who created the book Darkly Dreaming Dexter, which the series is based on. Dexter then sits at the showcase, waiting for a customer. Dexter's boss, Fred Jr., then walks over toward Dexter, wondering if he picked up any pastries before work. Luckily for Fred, Dexter came prepared and gives him one of the pastries. This moment reflects Dexter's old routine of getting donuts for the Miami Metro Police Department. Fred starts to talk about how he's going to adopt a puppy with his husband. Fred says his husband wants to name the dog Garfield, but he protests, thinking a dog shouldn't be named after a cat. He then asks Dexter what he thinks. Dexter says that he's Switzerland in the matter. Dexter's response is a reference to Season 2, Episode 8 of Dexter, when Lila and Deborah were arguing in Dexter's apartment. After the exchange, two customers walk into the store, one of them clearly having an attitude. This customer's name is Matt. Matt asks for a hunting knife and Dexter obliges by putting one on the glass showcase. Clearly, with an immature attitude, Matt starts to swing the blades sporadically. This yet again reminds me of Season 1, Episode 3 of Dexter, when Jeremy Downs did the exact same thing at a flea market when Dexter was trailing him. I just have to say, during my first watch through of this episode, I truly love witnessing these little homages from the original show. It's pretty cool to connect the pieces. After playing around with the knife, Matt points out a gun that he would also like to purchase. Dexter takes the gun down from its showcase and allows Matt to get a feel for it. Matt loves it and wants to purchase. However, his ID is placed on a 24-hour hold until the FBI checks on his record. Pissed off, Matt tries to purchase the weapon underneath the table, but Dexter firmly disagrees with this proposition and says, come back tomorrow to finalize the purchase. Matt says, you know, you break a rule. Sometimes you might even have a little fun. I believe this is a reference to Season 6, Episode 7, when Dexter mentally manifests Brian Moser and goes on a wild road trip. After one last attempt of persuasion, Matt understands that it's futile and decides to come back the next day to purchase the firearm. He still buys the hunting knife right then. After work, Dexter decides to go see his girlfriend at the police station, but is told that she is in a meeting. When she's done, Angela vents to Dexter about some missing person cases that have been piling up over the past few weeks. I believe these cases will be the main plot point of Season 9. Sadly, throughout the remainder of the episode, there aren't any more references to these disappearances, so I can't elaborate on them any further. Dexter gives her some support and says she'll be the one to solve these cases. Angela, trying to get her mind off of work, invites Dexter to go line dancing later that evening. Dexter accepts the invitation. Later that night, they meet up at a restaurant. Dexter orders some food and alcohol and sits down with Angela. 
They both chat for a little bit and then decide to go dancing. The song that plays in the background is called Heart of Glass. The lyrics that are being sung are Lost inside, adorable illusion, I cannot hide. I'm the one you're using. I believe this part of the song was placed here deliberately to represent Dexter's ongoing life. For example, the lyrics, Lost inside, adorable illusion, I cannot hide, signifies Dexter's inability to hide who he truly is, coming off as an adorable illusion that will be easily shattered by somebody. He understands the precarious circumstances, but doesn't know how to combat this inevitability which makes him feel lost inside. At a different location during this dancing session, a mysterious stranger hops out of a pickup truck. During this part of the episode, we don't know who this is. Returning back to the restaurant, we see Dexter sitting by himself, lovingly watching his girlfriend from afar. Out of nowhere, the customer from earlier, Matt, appears and tries to convince Dexter to let him get his gun from the gun shop. Dexter doesn't relent and tells him to come back to the shop in the morning. Matt drunkenly walks away, but not before making a comment about his girlfriend. Angela goes to the table Dexter is sitting at and talks to him for a little bit. However, she gets a notification from her smartphone and sees that her daughter, as well as a bunch of other teenagers, are going into her house, presumably to throw a party. This leads Angela to go home prematurely. Dexter also decides to leave and goes outside soon after. He walks towards his pickup truck, but as he is approaching it, we see the mysterious stranger spying on him, thickening the suspense at the thought of the hunter being the hunted. The next day, Dexter is running through the snowy landscape once again, presumably looking for the white deer he saw the previous morning. Luckily, he spots the deer and points his gun at it. His intentions here are a bit unknown, but just as we're about to see what he's going to do, Dexter hears the mysterious stranger lurking through the woods. This spooks the deer and makes it run off. Dexter approaches the mysterious stranger, but only spots the shoe prints that were left behind. We are back at Dexter's house where we can see him cooking breakfast. Dexter states to Deborah that he feels like he's being followed, and Deborah responds by saying he needs to avoid letting Matt get to him. To be blunt, Dexter thinks Matt is the mysterious stranger. Side note, the slice of ham Dexter's making for himself could be a reference to the original title sequence. Dexter says something which at first doesn't make any sense. It's been almost 10 years. The only way I could see him saying this is if he wanted to kill Matt. Deborah reminds Dexter that he needs to keep with his routine. Dexter agrees and eats his breakfast. When he's done, he goes to work and begins his routine. After doing his morning tasks, Dexter's lunch break rolls around and he walks to the Iron Lake Tavern to get a sandwich. However, he notices that there are protesters in front of said tavern. The protesters are complaining about drilling and the effects it has on nature. Dexter doesn't care and tries to find another place where he can get lunch. But just then, the mysterious stranger peers from behind a building. Dexter notices immediately and begins to approach the figure, but stops after the stranger quickly walks away. Looking concerned, Dexter goes back to the gun shop and is told by Fred to drop off a gun at Matt's house. Dexter is apprehensive, but is forced into doing it. Once he arrives, Dexter makes his way to Matt's room, getting help from Matt's friend, Bill. Once they get to the room, they find Matt having sex with a girl. The two of them then decide to wait in the bathroom and wait for Matt to finish. Bill whips out some cocaine and starts to snort it. He then offers some to Dexter, but he refuses. After Bill takes another hit, he mentions that Matt was involved in a boat crash. Dexter becomes intrigued and listens to Bill. Bill takes the third and final hit and starts to divulge details of the boat crash, saying that Matt intentionally drove into some guy's boat because he lost 500 grand to him. This ended up killing the man and five other civilians. After realizing what he said, Bill asks Dexter to keep this information between them. Bill walks away and Matt is done having sex, so Dexter approaches the bedroom. A woman named Becca walks out of the bedroom door and begs Dexter not to tell her father. Dexter again agrees. This woman could be a reference to Rebecca Mitchell from season 4. However, I only came up with this because of the first name similarity. Dexter walks into the room and asks for Matt's signature so he can officially give him the gun. Matt signs the form and starts to play around with the gun. This pisses Dexter off, which causes him to grab the gun back and crack Matt in the face with the recoil pad. However, this turns out to be a momentary thought from Dexter, meaning this didn't actually happen, but rather a bit of a daydream slash fantasy. Infuriated, Dexter walks out of the room to avoid beating the shit out of Matt. We then see Dexter driving back to his home late at night, but before he enters, he sees that an intruder is inside. After circling to the back of the house and grabbing a hatchet, Dexter enters through the back door and sneaks up on the intruder. The intruder is sifting through one of Dexter's drawers. Dexter confronts the figure, and the person says that they are Harrison Morgan. This, of course, being Dexter's only biological son. Out of shock and heartache, Dexter approaches Harrison, but Deborah's ghost appears in front of him. Deborah reminds Dexter that everyone close to him dies, and that's why he's in exile. Dexter stops, and he says that he doesn't know who Harrison is talking about. Harrison comments on the similar features that he remembers his father, Dexter, having. Dexter immediately shuts down the proposal by saying that his face is nothing out of the ordinary. Becoming upset, Harrison tells Dexter that, if he doesn't want him in his life, then he should just say it. At this point, the voice of Deborah starts listing off people from the past whom Dexter has killed. Dokes, LaGuerta, Rita. Deborah then lifts up her t-shirt and pulls out the bullet, which Oliver Saxon shot her with, out of her body and says, Me. Everyone. Dexter looks at Harrison and firmly refuses that he is Dexter Morgan. Dexter tells Harrison that he should go to the town shelter, where he should wait until the next bus out of town arrives. He opens his front door and Harrison walks into the woods. 
Dexter notices a pile of papers and looks through the drawer Harrison was rifling through. After a second, he finds a picture of himself and Harrison when Harrison was a toddler. With this picture in his hand, Dexter walks toward a window to see Harrison walking away. Deborah appears and tells Dexter that he did the right thing letting him go and that he will be safer with Hannah, Harrison's adoptive mother. Dexter then throws the photograph into his fire pit outside, getting rid of all the evidence leading back to his past. This is hands down one of the most emotional scenes I have seen in a while. All Harrison wants to know is who is his father, but because of Dexter's dark passenger, he can't allow himself to unintentionally hurt the only family he has left. I do have two questions though. How did Harrison know where to find Dexter? It's not like Dexter is an easy guy to track down. And how did Harrison even know Dexter was alive in the first place? In Season 8, Episode 12, Hannah McKay read a newspaper article explaining how Dexter Morgan perished at sea, so it's not like she could have told Harrison where to find him, or even to fill his head with this possibility. I guess it is possible that Harrison found Dexter in a photograph randomly one day, but the chances of that are very slim. I'm hoping later in the series they explain how Harrison found Dexter. I would hate for this to become an unexplained detail. After this heart-wrenching scene, we see Dexter walk outside of his house the next morning. He notices that one of his ice fishing traps have been tripped, and he goes to check it out. He removes one of the traps from the water and yanks up a chain. Suddenly, Deborah pops out of the water with a hospital gown, and is swiftly dragged back into the water by an all-black demon-like figure. Dexter then wakes up in a cold sweat, with Deborah whispering to him, It's okay. I'm glad I went first, Dexter. I hate to see you like this. If you had died first, I would have been lost in the world without you. You're a changed man. Almost 10 years without a kill. And I love you for it. After Deborah speaks her dialogue, Dexter sits in silence. I believe the monster in the dream was a physical manifestation of Dexter's dark passenger and how it consumes everyone around him with unrelenting dexterity. As for the dialogue spoken by Deborah, I believe Dexter is just trying to calm himself down using his sister's voice to enhance the effectiveness. I primarily believe this because of the line, almost 10 years without a kill, and I love you for it. This line is also most likely referencing the time Deborah tried to help Dexter by watching over him when she found out he was a serial killer. The amount of different interpretations people can have from the scene is almost infinite, so if you have your own take on what happened, make sure to share it in the comment section. After the dream sequence, we see the white deer Dexter has been hunting for, with Dexter hot on the creature's tail for the third and final time. After reaching a clearing, Dexter takes out his gun and looks through the scope, viewing the deer. He admires the elegance of the animal and with a look of awe slowly approaches it. Dexter takes off his gloves and walks a few steps before the deer notices him. The animal becomes startled but settles down after a few seconds. Dexter approaches with his hand out toward the deer, and the deer pushes his nose right up against it. He looks into the creature's eyes, with a face that looks to be in peace. However, this doesn't last long because a few seconds after making this connection, the deer is shot from far away. Dexter trips over himself by backing away, and the deer falls dead on the snowy ground. Someone screams out in celebration. The person approaches, and we find out that it was Matt who shot the deer. Dexter's anger rises to a boiling point, and he slams the butt of his rifle on Matt's forehead, knocking him out cold. After realizing what he did, Dexter approaches Matt, takes out the knife from Matt's side strap, and is about to stab him in the chest. Before he does this, Dexter gets a grip on his anger, and instead of going any further, he mocks up the crime scene by making it look like he was never involved. It's been a long time. But if I'm gonna do this, I need to do it right. First rule of the code. <laughs> Don't get caught. After slitting the deer's throat to blend in its blood with Matt's blood, Dexter eventually arrives at his home and begins to make a kill room in his shed. Before we continue on, I would like to mention my thoughts on the scene. Just like I mentioned in the very beginning of the video, I believe the similarities between this scene and the scene from Season 1, Episode 3 of the original show is meant to parallel Dexter's growth. In the past, this meant accepting his dark passenger, but in the present, this means letting go and finally breaking free from the monster inside. However, before he can internally redeem himself, Matt interferes with the process, symbolically destroying the gate that was holding the demon back thus far, letting it run free. This is implied by the song, All Right, playing in the background. The first lyrics are, I want him to know what I have done. I want him to know it's bad. I believe this correlates with what Dexter is doing with the deer. He wants the creature to know his wrongdoings so he can be absolved and finally reach a state of peace. However, Matt represents the stranglehold and inescapability the Dark Passenger has over Dexter. He will never be free nor redeemed under any circumstances. He has to pay retribution to everyone he murdered. This one scene makes me believe that by the end of this show, Dexter will die, finally being set free from his pain. Another interpretation could relate to Harrison. Perhaps, deep down, Dexter wants Harrison to know what he has done so he can unload the weight from his shoulders. Either one works, but I personally like the first one more. 
Dexter finishes up his kill room and straps Matt down to a table. He breaks the lantern and grabs two pieces of shattered glass, using them as blood slides. Matt wakes up and Dexter starts talking to him. During the conversation, Dexter shouts out, You're fucking crazy, man. Arguably, but not the point. Then what is? Tell me what you did! I believe this is a reference to the very first episode of the original Dexter series, when he says to Mike Donovan, Open your eyes and look at what you did! There's another small conversation, which is about how Matt didn't have his parents growing up, which caused him to be the person he is at that moment. Dexter scoffs, but makes a connection between himself and Harrison. He's most likely thinking to himself that if he doesn't give Harrison the proper guidance, he could end up like Matt. After conversing with Matt, Dexter kills him. The original end credit song, Blood Theme, starts to play. Dexter says to himself, Hi Dexter Morgan. This line of dialogue confirms his descent back into darkness. However, as an evolving monster, Dexter puts his makeshift blood slides on Matt's body and begins to chop him up into pieces. I believe this is referencing Season 7 Episode 1 of the original series, when LaGuardia finds Dexter's blood slide of Travis Marshall. He finally realizes trophies are too much of a risk to have. When he's done chopping up the body, Deborah confronts Dexter, but he completely ignores her. This shows that our actual Dexter is no longer in the driver's seat, but has become the passenger. There's no other way of looking at it without him being uncharacteristic. Dexter then hops into his pickup truck and drives off to an ice lake. Here is where he dumps off Matt's corpse. When he is done, Dexter drives to the bus station where he finds and talks to Harrison. Dexter confirms that he is Dexter Morgan and wants him to stay at his house. Harrison agrees and Dexter drives the both of them back to his house. Dexter talks to himself, saying that just like Harry, he's going to be there for his son. As the two of them walk into the house, splashes of blood can be seen in the snow. This shows Dexter is sloppy and is bound to make more mistakes going forward. This is where we get the end credits scene leaving things ambiguous. Now that I'm done giving my overview and deep search, it's time for me to give my overall impression of the episode. When I dove into this episode, I tried to look at it through an uncluttered lens. I didn't want past episodes to determine whether or not this new series would be good or bad. I wanted to be Switzerland in the matter. However, after about 5 minutes into the episode, I realized I didn't have to suppress my memory of past episodes. Everything fit together very nicely and nothing felt out of place. I actually encourage you to go into the series knowing everything about the original Dexter. It definitely enhances the new story in so many magnificent ways. I never felt like the references were overwhelming or the show was trying to shoehorn easter eggs for nostalgia's sake. Everything felt 100% natural. As for the characters, I was slightly disappointed. Besides Harrison, everyone in the episode didn't seem noteworthy in any way, shape, or form. If we compare Season 1 Episode 1 of the original series to this episode, we can clearly see more fleshed out characters than in this reboot. James Dokes, Angel Batista, Vince Masuka, and even Rita's kids, Aster and Cody, have more interesting dynamics than anyone in the extension. Not to say these characters are deplorable, but they are lacking in substance and depth. This may be because we're supposed to focus solely on Dexter for the first episode, but this was the same task for the original pilot. How come the storytellers are able to make more convincing characters in the past than in the present? It could just be the style of these new writers, but I wonder if there's something more to it. Everyone in Iron Lake, New York just seemed unrealistically happy. I honestly kept thinking of Sneedville from the Lorax every time a townsfolk appeared on screen, with the exception of Matt and Bill. These characters are fine, but still lack substance when compared to the original pilot. Matt was supposed to be the first villainous character in the series, however the entire time I actually felt bad for him. He came off as a punk teenager that had issues with his parents, spending his life partying away and hunting game for fun. Honestly, pretty 2D. Even the way it was revealed that Matt killed people was pretty weak. He was just blackout drunk and decided to do dangerous actions. I honestly can believe that his mental capabilities were so impaired that he didn't actually know that ramming the other guy's boat would actually kill the guy, or the five other people. That's the thing with getting blackout drunk. You have no recollection of anything. Matt's character really reminded me of Matt Chambers, who killed Alexander Price in the original series. Chambers was also in a drunken state. The two characters even shared the same name at Matt. I wouldn't doubt that Matt in this episode was inspired by Matt Chambers from the original Dexter. They're pretty much identical. Now before commenting that this guy fits the code, and deserves to die, let's compare the first villainous character we see in the original pilot, Mike Donovan. Even though Mike was on screen for significantly less time than Matt, he still had a lot more depth to him. During the confrontation with Dexter, Mike sincerely regretted his crimes, but at the same time couldn't help himself killing those choir boys. He wasn't able to control his urges as well as Dexter. This makes him sympathetic, but significantly less so than if he were inebriated. Also, the fact that Mike Donovan consciously raped and molested those boys before murdering them also added to his depraved personality. He reminds me of Paul Stefani, or the weepy voice killer. They both committed horrific acts, but felt horrendous afterward. If the first person Dexter killed was someone like this, who had uncontrollable urges to murder, or at the very least was extremely unlikable, that would have given more justification to Dexter for killing again after 10 years of sobriety. 
As for Bill, he's pretty much treated as a plot device. You could switch him with literally anybody, and it wouldn't affect the story in the slightest. This in itself is disappointing because it shows some type of laziness, but what are you gonna do? One last thing on characters is related to Jennifer Carpenter's performance as Deborah. I thought she was well utilized and a perfect replacement for Harry. Throughout her presence in the episode, Dexter's self-inflicted torment becomes more obvious. He has to live with his dead sister by his side for the rest of his life, always feeling the guilt that he killed her. One thing I really loved about this extension is the overwhelming amount of symbolism through the music and through Dexter's actions. I thought the music was utilized perfectly to show the internal struggles of Dexter's psyche. I would like to commend the director and editor for including these small but significant details. As for the deer, I thought it was a very heartwarming metaphor for Dexter's will to move on and to redeem himself in his own eyes. I believe he truly wanted to change and remove the dark passenger from his life for good. My overall opinion of this episode is that it was exceptionally made, but the characters could have used more depth and individuality. Take that as you will, it's just the outcome I've personally observed. Nevertheless, I still highly recommend watching this episode on Showtime. I encourage all of you to form your own opinions of the show, and not just use my review as an excuse to not enjoy the episode. Thank you everyone for watching this video. I can't wait for the next episodes of Dexter New Blood to be released so I can make videos about them. I hope you all have a fantastic day, and I'll see you in the next video.